Hi, I'm Tommy Thompson and welcome to AI 101, the series that explores the tools and techniques used in video game development here on AI and Games. In the first entry of this series, I looked at the Navigation Mesh, a data structure used in 3D games to enable AI characters to move around an environment. We then followed this up by exploring Behaviour Trees, arguably the most commonly used AI technique currently in AAA video games for handling character behaviour. In this episode, we're going to explore one of the most pivotal techniques used in building AI systems for video games for more than 20 years, the finite state machine. While not as pervasive as they once were, finite state machines are still a great starting point for many an aspiring AI developer, and next to navigation meshes are one of the first AI techniques I still teach to this day. I'm going to explain what a finite state machine is, how you go about designing these systems, the innovations and changes made over the past 20 years, and return to the game that defined their popularity in Valve's classic 1998 shooter, Half-Life. Alrighty, so let's talk some basic theory. A finite state machine, often referred to as a finite state automaton, is a model commonly used to simulate simple sequential logic. It's largely derived from two bodies of work by George H. Mealy and Professor Edward F. Moore in 1955 and 1956, respectively. The system is a collection of one or more predefined states. When modelling AI behaviour in a game, a state will represent a specific behaviour that a character or other system in the game should execute. This could be standing idle, attacking the player, moving to a point in the world, interacting with an object, whatever the designer sees fit. Often this means we're handling various aspects of gameplay systems such as animation and sound as well as decision making for whatever system the finite state machine is controlling. The state machine will continue to hold the current state as active until it receives an input that it recognises, at which point it will then transition to another state within the system. As a designer, you can decide what inputs a state receives are valid for a transition to occur as well as what states it will transition to based on this information. I say states plural because you can decide to have a state transition to one or more states in the event it reads a given input. This results in either a deterministic finite state machine, which is where a state reads an input and can only transition to one other state, or a non-deterministic finite state machine, meaning that if that input occurs, the system could transition to a number of different states. Now the benefit of this approach is that it means you can define multiple states that when implemented can lace into a much more nuanced behaviour. A good example is the AI of games such as Pac-Man and Ms. Pac-Man, where the state in which a ghost hunts the player is unique for each enemy type, but at an abstract level they're all doing the same thing. But once the player grabs a power pill, all the ghosts transition into an evade state which changes how they move through the world. Now the movement code is largely similar for both states, but in this case we're trying to avoid the player instead of chasing them, and to help players understand what's happening, the audio and visuals change accordingly. And of course, once the power pill fades, each ghost will transition back to chasing the player again. Finite state machines help create AI that can not only respond to their own internal memory, given they make decisions about states to transition to based on information stored internally, but can also react to events happening in the world and be versatile to change often driven by the player. As a result, for many years finite state machines were the de facto standard of how to build AI in games until arguably the mid to late 2000s. Depending on the problem scale and size, this is ideal for your character behaviours and can provide a variety of rich and interesting gameplay opportunities. A great example of this can be found in the Batman Arkham franchise that relies on finite state machines to construct the enemy characters both in combat as well as in stealth segments. This fits well with the overall approach taken to the enemy designs. They need to react to what's happening around them and the governing gameplay systems can send specific inputs to them to dictate what they should be doing at any given time. For example, the combat system sends input signals to each character to ensure that combat is both dynamic as well as challenging. This can mean picking up a crowbar or a gun, moving into an attack position, or just trying to take a shot at the Dark Knight. Meanwhile in stealth segments, the armed guards will typically patrol, but are often reacting to changes in the world. Their buddies are taken down, they perhaps see the player swinging past, or hear exploding gel taken at a wall. In each case, these send inputs to the system that dictate what to do in that capacity. But despite the benefits of having this level of modular control, there are a number of reasons why the AAA games industry has moved away from state machines over the past 10 years, with the likes of Behaviour Trees, popularised by Halo 2, as well as planning techniques such as FEAR's goal-oriented action planning, challenging the idea that FSMs were the default approach to take. There are several reasons for this, 
but the two big ones are how labour intensive they are to build, but also that they don't scale well as the number of behaviours and transitions increases. The more possibilities your design has to cater towards, the more unique transitions between states that need to be captured, and in turn the more circumstances you're going to have to debug and support. Now, one approach to resolving this is to use HFSMs, hierarchical finite state machines, which were originally conceived in 1987. In this instance, you can group states together such that a transition can either go to a specific state as usual, but it can also go to a collection of states that have been built to transition in specific ways. In essence, you could go so far as to build a state machine that effectively transitions between more modular state machines. This would allow for more carefully managing the operation of specific behaviours and how entire subsets of behaviour move between one another. Hierarchical FSMs are still adopted as recently as 2016 as part of the AI toolchain in id Tech Engine 5, with the likes of Machine Games Wolfenstein The New Order and the reboot of Doom still using them to full effect. But it is worth noting that while this still enables some flexibility, the issues of scalability and complexity are nonetheless compounded using a hierarchical finite state machine, you've essentially just shifted the issue one level higher in the architecture. So now that we've got the theory out of the way, let's chat about the AI of Half-Life. Back in 1998, Half-Life's AI was pretty groundbreaking and became highly influential in subsequent years, and I want to talk about how it works. The actual C++ code is publicly accessible and can be found by downloading the Half-Life SDK, and I've linked to it in the description if you want to take a look. While quite dated by current standards, many of the core principles of how state machines were adopted in subsequent years can be seen in this codebase. All non-player characters in Half-Life are derived from a common monster type. Every character in the game, be it a scientist, security guard, headcrab, soldier or alien, is ultimately a monster, per the C++ polymorphic hierarchy. In the code of the core monster class, there is a definition of a state, but it isn't the state of a finite state machine. A state in the Half-Life codebase actually reflects how the AI character is operating at that time. This ranges from being idle to alert, prone or even dead. In addition to this, there are also conditions, which reflect the information that a monster has at that point in time, and also a set of sensors that help those conditions to be updated. I'm going to come back to this in a minute, given these are important factors in dictating how and why certain actions are executed in the finite state machine. The critical part is that each monster type is capable of executing a variety of tasks. Each task essentially corresponds to a state in a finite state machine, and there are over 80 unique tasks available for use. These range from primitive simple behaviours, such as facing a given object or crouching, all the way to walking paths through the game world, finding good points of cover for combat, dodging attacks and playing sound effects. Given the polymorphic nature of the code, the base monster class handles many of the commonly used tasks such as movement, while tasks that might require unique configuration for each character can be handled in each of their own individual classes. This means that the security guards and scientists can have unique variations of the same behaviour that better fit their roles within the game. Meanwhile, different soldier types can handle target acquisition, running to cover, and attacking in their own unique way. But the thing is, the characters in Half-Life can't just work in a purely reactive capacity. If there are so many different tasks that can be executed, the system needs to know what transitions it can make in the state machine, as well as which tasks make sense to be running at any given point in time. So the Half-Life AI becomes more deliberative, meaning that it needs to work through the finite state machine and transition from state to state in practical and interesting ways that enables for a more complicated and long-term behaviour to be established. There are two ways that Half-Life's AI supports this, first through schedules, and then through goals. Schedules glue together tasks in meaningful ways, often resulting in macros of intelligent behaviour. There are around 40 unique schedules in the game, with them often gluing together movement, attack, sound and animation actions into a more cohesive behaviour. One thing that's important here is that tasks can't be merged or blended, hence if a character needs to get into cover given the player is firing on them, you'll notice that they'll give up shooting at you in order to retreat rather than laying down a more suppressive fire given attacking and running are two distinct tasks in the system. In some cases, an AI character might require multiple schedules to be executed in sequence in order to achieve an even more complicated behaviour, and that's where goals come in handy. There's only five of them in the game, 
but in each case when active, it dictates that upon completing a given schedule, another one needs to be selected that will help that goal to be realised. Now, outside of goals, there are other ways a schedule can change, and that's either upon completion of the current one, where in many instances the final task listed is telling the system to select a new one, or, given the dynamic nature of the game, something in the world will cause a schedule to become invalid and the monster needs to select a new one. Each schedule has its own set of conditions that have to stay true in order for it to not only be selected, but also continue to operate. In the case of either ensuring the current schedule is still valid, or selecting a new one, that's where the state and conditions I've mentioned previously come in handy. The states are important given the AI that is dead or incapacitated are unable to make decisions, and you know, rightfully so. Meanwhile the conditions, which are how the AI character sees the world, are updated based upon the execution of the schedule as well as new data received from vision, sound and smell sensors. Look sensors are driven by line of sight for a given AI within their respective view cones, while sound is based largely on whether a sound effect should have been heard by an AI character based on their proximity to the point of origin. But as mentioned, some of the monsters, notably the aliens, also have a sense of smell, and this is actually the exact same system as the audio, only it's just an inaudible sound event being played in this instance. There are 32 conditions an AI can recognise, and they're all binary in nature, given they're stored in a 32-bit integer, meaning they can only ever be true or false. This is a pretty compact method for storing a variety of information, such as whether an enemy is visible, they receive damage, heard a sound, as well as two special fields that can be customised by each monster type. And ultimately, this data will help each monster to decide whether a new schedule needs to be selected, given it might be that the current schedule becomes invalid or something has happened in the world that dictates it needs to change its behaviour more drastically. Whilst over 20 years old, the AI behind Half-Life is still very effective for its needs, and for aspiring AI developers is worth exploring. Heck, I'm pretty sure you can adapt this into your own games and get something that would still be more than adequate for many a small tier indie project. I hope this helps everyone out there better understand the underlying theory of how finite state machines operate, their history in games, and you maybe even learned a thing or two about the games you love along the way. I've listed some other useful resources on state machines in the video description for you to check out, but also I want to help you make finite state machines for building AI in your own games. So be sure to check out my tutorial channel Table Flip Games, where you can find a series of videos showing you how to build a simple AI character using a finite state machine implementation in the Unity game engine. Plus, here on AI and Games, be sure to check out my existing videos on Batman Arkham Asylum as well as Doom 2016 to deep dive into how FSMs are used in AAA games. With this topic completed, it allows us to start exploring more deliberative behaviour. As we saw in Half-Life, being purely reactive isn't sufficient. You need your AI to be able to make more long-term decisions, and this will allow us in a future episode of AI 101 to look at automated planning. Specifically, we'll take a look at the goal-oriented action planning system, meaning I can revisit the game that started the AI in Games channel, Monolith's 2005 horror shooter, First Encounter Assault Recon. Thanks for watching this episode of AI 101 here on AI in Games. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more on the AI of your favourite games. AI 101 alongside my case study and design dive series are sponsored by and voted for by my supporters on Patreon. If you want to join our community and have a say in future episodes on the show, join the AI in Games Patreon using the links on screen now and in the description. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all again soon.